Hello everyone and thank you for your time today. I'm Joelle, the client partner for travel here at AWIM and I'm really excited to be hosting our second travel webinar of 2020. The next hour will be packed with UK travel trends as well as futuristic and inspiring discussions with our panel of experts. On the panel today, we have a fantastic selection of guests incorporating perspectives from across the industry and a wide variety of expertise. We have James from Holiday Extras, Sean from Equator, Claire from Unicodo and Hattie from Top Cashback. I'll be formally introducing our panellists in due course. But first, we want to hear from you. We want this webinar to be as interactive and as useful as possible for our audience. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do use our Q&A function within this webinar. Your questions can then be upvoted by the rest of the audience. And once we're finished with our initial discussions, I'll put your questions to our guests. First of all, I'd like to give you a quick insight into the trends that we've been tracking at, across the travel sector at AWIN year to date and provide some initial context for our discussions. We all know that 2020 has been a year like no other and across the travel industry, we felt it more than most. The year started off well and in AWIN UK, we saw travel bookings up 21% in January versus 2019. However, as the news of coronavirus spread across the globe, the public was asked to stay home from March. Travellers, planes and bookings all came to a halt. That month, we saw a 6% decline in bookings versus the previous year. And as spring approached, performance took a monumental turn, more than 90% down throughout April to June versus last year. During the summer, we some, saw some normality begin to return. Pubs, restaurants and tourist attractions reopened, as well as some major holiday destinations. That paired with our agreed travel corridors, we saw some performance begin to pick up. June saw an 180% increase in performance versus the previous month of May, and July saw an even bigger jump up 234% month on month comparative to June. Performance remained relatively strong for 2020 numbers across travel throughout autumn. But recently in November, we saw our second lockdown. This time, Boris was clear it would only last one month. And as a result, performance dipped 50% month on month but the year on year drop was nowhere near as stark as our first lockdown. Here you can see the top travel KPIs looking at the whole landscape from January to November 2020. Whilst bookings for the year were down 61% overall, traffic was less so at 35%. Consumers are still browsing for travel content, travel inspiration, and crucially this year, travel advice. As a result, conversion rate hit 6% for 2020, down 50% versus 2019. AOV for the sector is up largely, hitting £251 on average, a huge 60% increase on last year. It's apparent that whilst less consumers are booking, those that are still able to find time and opportunity to travel are willing to spend more on average per booking. ROI was also up in 2020 by 47% and hitting 35, close to £35. Whilst many travel brands have understandably had to pull back at certain times throughout this year, those brands who are still able to invest in the channel are seeing a stronger return on those higher AOV trips. I've split those previous KPIs into two segments. Open months, January, February, July, August, September and October. Really those months where there were no or less restrictions and our lockdown months, March, April, May, June and November, where travel was not advised unless essential. Naturally, you can see that in those months in which we were less restricted, we saw a lighter drop in traffic, bookings and conversion rate year on year. However, 
What is interesting to see is that during those lockdown months, we saw a bigger surge in ROI and AOV. Whilst there was 85% less bookings being made during these months, customers were spending on average 237% more per booking versus last year. This graph demonstrates more specifically what has been purchased throughout 2020. The graph is ordered by total volume of bookings in the January to November this year, and the line demonstrates the performance change per subsector year on year. As you can see, hotels and accommodation saw the biggest volume year to date, despite still being down 38% year on year. Airport transfers in second place, followed by travel agencies down 61% and 67% respectively. Whilst many missing out on going abroad this year, we saw the UK take to staycations and more localised fun with the family. As a result, tourist attractions and local holidays saw smaller declines year on year, down 30% and 26%. In fact, the only travel subsector to see flat performance year on year in terms of sales showing 0% growth on the, on the graph above is labelled as lead generation. A lot of these campaigns are promoting taxi apps. Lead generation campaigns, unlike traditional CPA activity, are not always considered an always on campaign and therefore could have likely skewed the data of the year on year comparison here. As well as understanding what consumers were buying, I also wanted to take a look at where this browsing traffic was coming from on a publisher type level across the whole travel space. The largest traffic contributor this year was actually sub networks, overtaking pure discount partners from top place in 2019. In fact, sub networks were only one of three promotional types to see growth this year in terms of traffic within the travel sector alongside email and social rewards up 116%, albeit still the smallest category in terms of volume. I know that all of our partners are looking forward to turning this trend around in travel in 2021 and begin to see the sector make its comeback. Along with the decreasing number of bookings this year due to the pandemic, we also saw a rise in cancellations. News spread, policies were extended and holidays were cancelled. Many brands and partners came together to support cash flow by allowing customers to either move the date of their booking or offer gift vouchers or credit where possible instead of full cash refunds and cancellations. However, with the UK economy holding a lot of uncertainty, paired with a proportion of Brits on furlough themselves, many still opted for that full refund. This graph shows the correlation between bookings and cancellations for one OTA on the AWIN network. As you can see, bookings versus cancellations took the reverse trends. And unsurprisingly, in the height of lockdown one and lockdown two, we saw an increase in the percentage of cancelled orders when uncertainty was at its highest. Part of AWIN's tracking offering is to offer deeper conversion analytics. This is achieved using our custom parameter tracking capabilities, which allows our advertisers to pass back additional information at checkout outside of our standard metrics, such as sales price and referring publishers. Some popular conversion analytic metrics for travel include the likes of stay date, business versus leisure trips and the number of passengers. Looking at the same OTA, we can compare the time between booking and stay day across 2019 and 2020. The average number of days between booking and stay day was 115 days in 2019. However, this rose to 174 days in 2020. This year, we've seen a direct correlation between UK lockdown regulations and longer lag times. In fact, in May this year, those customers that were still booking holidays were booking around 292 days in advance. That was 202 days longer than last May. Confidence of a summer trip this 2020 was low 
And as a result, those consumers were still keen to have something in the diary to look forward to and were willing to wait over nine months for their next venture. Perfect. I'd now like to dive straight into our panel discussion. As mentioned, if you have any questions you'd like to ask our panellists, please do submit them within our Q&A function. It now gives me great pleasure to formally introduce our panellists. James, Head of Partnerships at Holiday Extras. James has been at Holiday Extras for over 15 years, overseeing all of their business partnerships, from UK airports to insurance providers, including our affiliate partners. James is also part of the Board of Directors at the Institute of Travel and Tourism. Sean, Affiliate Team Leader at Equator, with over 12 years experience in e-commerce and affiliate marketing. Sean oversees the team responsible for Mal Mason, Hotel Devant and Village Hotels, to name a few. Claire, COO at Unicodo. Claire launched into her career in marketing 13 years ago and has built up a plethora of experience across Cherry London, Rainmaker and Thomas Cook Money. As COO at Unicodo, Claire is focused on driving exponential growth, leading strategy, brand, marketing and partnerships and Harriet, Head of Partnerships at Top Cashback. Hattie started her digital marketing career back in 2010. She joined Top Cashback in 2013 as an account manager and now oversees all partnerships as head of department. Perfect, that brings us on to our first question for the panel. And James, I'll be starting with you if that's okay. This year has brought its complications, but through the struggles, we've seen many success stories. Brands have adapted and innovated to support their own businesses and other businesses. Can you talk us through how your business has pivoted this year to adapt to the pandemic? Sure, thanks, Joel. Um, yeah, interesting. It kind of relates to one of your slides there in terms of dealing with uh, dealing with the high level of cancellations. Uh, the, fir the first example I'm going to give. So. Um, we were we were sort of experienced about a year's worth of cancellations over the, the course of six weeks, and it was vital to to keep as much cash in the business as possible, as you've alluded to there. And lots of businesses didn't really have the mechanisms to do this, and especially us, we'd, we'd never 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 experienced that level of, of cancellations before. So. To do that, we had to think on our feet and basically start to offer the customers a voucher if they wanted to take that. And some of them, a large percentage of customers were happy to take a voucher, but we didn't have a system to operate that. Um, so we had to develop a system within within the, the space of a few weeks, really, to allow the customers then to come back and use those use those vouchers. So we were issuing vouchers with, with actually no way of the customer redeeming them uh, to begin with. But we did that um, at some at some pace. So I think that's it's kind of testament to the, the speed in which we can we can produce those those kinds of results, but also how you can come together in a time of need and do something which is completely um, completely new. And a big piece of work for the business to undertake, particularly when we had a large percentage of the team on furlough. So that that piece of work has really given us um, a platform to move forward um, and offer our customers something in the future. So we have a voucher system now which we can use to offer our partners vouchers, our customers vouchers instead of discounts. Um, or commission if that's if that's what they they want to do in the future. So that gives us and that gives us something neat to play around with moving forward. I think the other thing we rec we recognised was quite obviously quite early on was that the staycation was going to be big and it has been massive in in 2020. We've seen you know six million people in Cornwall over the summer. Um, and we think that's going to continue to uh, continue to grow like that over the next couple of years obviously there is going to be much more overseas travel we believe in 21 and 22 but there is going to be a, a certain percentage of customers that are going to true choose to staycation instead and we want to position ourselves that we can capture some of that market as well so whilst we continue to offer the overseas airport related products we're de we've developed and and developing a um, a breaks program which will allow the customer to choose a choose an attraction within the uk such as a, a theme park or a major attraction and package that with a hotel in the local area um, so we can capture those breaks in between the, the customer's main holidays or just if they want to do a staycation in that year um, 
and that's going to be available to direct customers and through um, through our B2B partners as well. Um, and contracting, um, we've never contracted so far in advance, appreciating the longer lag times that you called out there in your presentation. Um, we're certainly experiencing that and we're certainly seeing um, bookings falling into 2022 now. Um, people like TUI have gone out much earlier with their 2022 program. Um, and we've had to be there to support those guys in that. And we've gone out and got that product and that stock available right until the end of 2022. Um, as well as that, we've had to review our, our whole strategy within the business and pivot on that and, and change that and make that much more customer focused and really think about the strengths that we have within the business um, and really focus on that without doing too much outside of that. Obviously, we now have a reduced team. We've had to restructure as a business. So, yeah, making making the most of the people that we've got we've got within the business. And the last point I think that um, I'd like to mention on this is that we uh, we developed our API quite quickly over the summer to appreciate the fact that teams were getting smaller and there was much of a a, a much greater need for a one-stop shop. So having more products available within our API, more capable, more capability within our API um, allows our partners to, to work with us um, for several different products um, through one API and allows them to have you know, one, one contact for several different products as opposed to having several different relationships across five or six different uh, different businesses. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot in there that I think we've learned and we've had to uh, streamline and develop over the last few months quite quickly. Yeah, just just a couple of small strategic changes to the, yeah, to the yeah, whole few, business. Yeah. <laughs> um, Claire, I wanted to come to you on this same question actually, because I know Unicode were doing some really some really cool things in terms of supporting their brands and across the changes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it really builds on on what James has been saying. Really, you know, the, the key things that that travel brands were really struggling with, um, you know, at the beginning and throughout were cancellations is the the most obvious piece. But I think it's useful to kind of add some context in in what was going on there. And James, I'm sure you'll you'll nod, nod along to this. But um, you know, when when furlough ha when lockdown happened, and you know, lots of people suddenly had to work from home. We had furlough added into that as well. The pressure on call centres was immense. You know, we had to suddenly gear up an entire call centre team that would normally work on site to work remotely. We had people on furlough. We had people isolating. So the the, the scale and scope of of you know travel um, customer service capability suddenly was really reduced at a time where there was a huge amount of customer anxiety around travel. You know, is it going to happen? What happens to my money? I might have lost my job. I need to get that money back. So there was this kind of furious few months where it, it did feel very panicked and the pressures, you know, on the business to keep that liquidity, you know, keep that, keep, try and keep um, customers bookings was, you know, was paramount. But also then how you balance that with what, you know, typically would have been quite a manual process to issue credit refunds. Um, we, as, as, you know, James alluded to, we actually helped um, our clients pivot our solution. Um, so instead of issuing out, out discounts, we actually used our unique code platform to be able to then issue these credit no refunds, giving our, our clients that control, you know, knowing that it's um, associated to a customer with the right booking reference, with a unique code, um, you know, and, and that was um, something that we were able to automate. So, you know, a key thing for them was, you know, how do we reduce impact on our, our customer service team and our call centre? We need to prioritise who they're talking to based on, you know, the nearest departure dates. Um, so automating that process, you know, A, number one, helps them to, to keep bookings, to keep money in the business, but actually took a lot of pressure off the business as well to help them deal with this kind of mammoth operational, reputational challenge that was that was going on. So, you know, it, it was a really fraught time, but, you know, we were able to, to help them pivot uh, quite quickly. And it was also about how you then, you know, think a bit creatively about your, your incentive programs. So, you know, lots of travel businesses offer flexible bookings and flexible bookings as well help kind of take that pressure off of um, the business. If, if plans change, things get cancelled, things need to move. 
customers can deal with that themselves. So actually we were creating incentives around flexible booking. So either giving, you know, things like that away for free or giving them highly discounted access to flexible booking just to try and, you know, get, give a, a great customer experience, feel like we're giving some value back to customers, you know, whilst they're booking and, and taking pressure off the business. So, yeah, it was um, an ex- exciting is probably the wrong word, but, you know, that sort of <laughs> frantic, fraught um, period of time where you're dealing with these things. Um, but yeah, certainly the automation was was really important to try and limit the amount of things they're having to deal with all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, you, you definitely touched on a few important parts there. Like all, automation's been a huge trend this year, and yeah, like you said, improving that customer experience, getting creative with the way in which we can enhance our customers' um, day-to-day experience. Yeah, I suppose both during a pandemic where there where there are needing to be cancellations and changes, but but moving that into the new year as well. So that actually brings me on to my next question, which Sean, I'd like to come to you next, if that's okay. Um, So obviously throughout this year, we've seen so many changes and we've already started to talk about how businesses have adapted to those changes. And I feel like we've really some new marketing techniques have been born this year. I'm a a real one for looking for positives in the pandemic. And I think think this can play part of that story. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on new marketing techniques that you've come that you've seen throughout this year that you think will now carry into the future of travel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thanks very much, Joel, and thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I think Rob, I, I don't want to swerve your question straight away, but I think I would just start off by saying that I think if anything, 2020 has taught us the importance um, as affiliate marketers, just how agile we need to be. Um, I think, you know, we, we've all been in the same boat, despite the fact we sit on opposite sides of the fence that, you know, when, when the pandemic hit and when we went into the first lockdown, I mean, things were literally changing by the hour. Um, so for me, you know, as much as there's been kind of certain aspects and certain technologies we've been able to employ to kind of get through the worst of it, I think, you know, the, the take home message from me has, has very much been, you know, our skills as affiliate marketers, the fact that we talk to each other, you know, more so maybe than some of the other digital channels and um, where things are highly automated, the fact that we can still pick up the phone and speak to each other and keep each other in the loop, that has been absolutely crucial. Um, I know for ourselves as an agency, you know, speaking to our clients every day, where previously it may have been, you know, your kind of your week whip calls, your monthly meetings, and um, you know the fact that you're in constant dialogue with your, your your internal teams as well as then your network and your affiliate partners has been um, absolutely crucial. And I don't think, to be honest with you, we would have gotten through um, the tough months without that and being able to adapt. Um, as affiliate marketers, but to to get back to the actual question that you did ask me, rather than rambling on, um, there has been some um, you know things that we have been able to lean on definitely to to, to try and get a, a bigger picture, um, you know, of of what's been going on over the last couple of months. I think you touched on it yourself there um, at the start, Joel, just the, the importance of kind of customer custom parameter tracking um, with Awin. Um, I think for all the hotel clients that we look after, um, you know, the, the information that we we've always kind of pulled through for them, whether that's a uh, you know number of nights that that a customer staying when their actual um, stay date is uh, doing a bit of analysis on kind of booking to stay date um, has been has been really important but then also kind of staying on top of the validation side of things as well making sure that we're aware of the cancellation rate how that is fluctuating um, and also how our kind of um, hotel clients are dealing with with customers and are they kind of have they got a process in place where they can update the the stay dates and, and kind of book again for further on in the year um, and all of that has been has been really really um, important for us and that's just your kind of you know your your, your kind of grassroots um kind of you know using the the, the tracking and um, parameters that are available to you um i think then on top of that and again it hasn't been like a silver bullet or anything but the, the covid performance um tracker that, that that you guys brought out and that gives you that overview on a kind of a sector and a subsector level has been kind of um you know, really important for us as well to dip in and out of and, and, and kind of know what the, the, the wider impact is um, and also kind of keep our clients in the loop as well with just the impact that we've seen, um, you know, just across the board. I think that has been um, really, really important as well. Um, and then finally, um, I think one of the ones, and again, this is for me kind of exciting and it, it feels weird to say something exciting happened in this year, but, um, you know, stuff that, that um, A1 has kind of pioneer, pioneered this year, um, the Affinity Partnerships um, project, where kind of almost taking a step back from the meaning of, you know, an affiliate partnership and looking kind of bigger picture at what that can mean um, and starting to have some like really, really interesting discussions with other brands out there and and kind of, you know, looking at a new way of of defining uh, performance marketing. So, yeah, those have kind of been really the highlights for me. Um, But just to go back to what I started um, with, I, I, I do think that the human touch in affiliate marketing and what we're known for and what makes our channel different has been absolutely vital this year and I think will remain so uh, for 2021 as well. 
Perfect. Thanks so much. We're doing so many call outs for A wins, <laughs> tracker and custom prices. No I'll transfer you a fiver after this. <laughs> um, you touched upon um, the importance of like data and using data to understand what's happening. And, and actually, Hattie, I wanted to come to you next and talk about, I suppose, what we've seen just in the last couple of days. So lockdown in the UK has been over for eight days, although we certainly still have those tiers in place. And I wondered if you could just talk us through the performance that you've started to see coming through in the last sort of eight days and if that changes on, on a tier level. Um, I'm also going to add an extra surprise layer to this question, but we've just had one come in from the audience about um, that there's so much news in the press at the moment around less air travel to help the UK decarbonise. And do we anticipate changes in the sector from um, different consumers in terms of like a younger, environmentally friendly consumer is going to be stopped travelling? And I wondered in your numbers, as well as looking at just what's happened over the last two, uh, ten, eight or so days, if you see that those differences coming into play in terms of the, the different generations. Hi, Joel. Yes, um, I'll try and answer as much as that as, <laughs> as I can remember. Um, but yeah, so we've we've definitely seen um, an increase in in kind of um, searches and, and clicks and sales since uh, around like the, when the, the Oxford vaccine came came to light on the 20, 22nd of November. So that's when we started seeing a slight increase and it's kind of steadily gone up since then um, with kind of reaction to what's going on with the introduction of the tears and and Black Friday as well. We did see, you know, some more um, more sales coming through off the off the back of that. Um, we haven't seen like a, a massive spike, um, which is obviously expected. We, you know, there, there hasn't been a, a great change and everyone is still expecting there to be lockdown again after Christmas. So, um, yeah, we haven't seen seen some kind of like massive spike in terms of breaking it down a bit into uh, what, what we have seen. So um, we've seen an increase in the last eight days um, in bookings uh, in the UK. So we're seeing about in terms of accommodation, about 71% of our bookings are UK based. Um, that's up about 8% from from what we were seeing in November. Um, and it's up um, about 10 to 15% year on year. So there's definitely more focus on on booking um, booking in, in the UK. Um, during November, we saw that um, some of our kind of key UK destinations stopped. Uh, being as popular like um, Manchester and Birmingham, Edinburgh and the like, um, they were usually kind of our key key uh, destinations in the UK and they seem to drop off and that was probably down to business, uh, business travel, but obviously the restrictions in general. Uh, we did see an increase in bookings in Dubai, obviously um, without there being any restrictions uh, on quarantine when you come back. So so we did see, interestingly see that that go up. Um, and since then, in, in the last eight days, um, those kind of business bookings seem to be to be coming back. Um, we've also seen more European bookings. Um, so uh, there's been a slight increase um, in Spain and France, Germany and, and Portugal, um, but not uh, nothing kind of dramatic um, as kind of expected. We wouldn't, wouldn't really expect there to be a huge, huge spike. Um, so, so yeah, and and we're seeing, I suppose, people booking um, more for Christmas. So um, the last ten days of December, we're seeing there are more more UK bookings coming through. Uh, they tend to be shorter stays um, and and lower value stays because of obviously the restrictions. Um, but yeah, but I suppose in, in general, we are seeing it going in the right direction. We are seeing um, more kind of um, positive. Uh, in terms of bookings, but but as expected, it, it's not you know suddenly a massive spike. The last couple of days, actually, with with Matt Hancock talking about um, uh, uh, being traveling, being able to go on our summer holidays next year, and and there has seen more interest, uh, which is is encouraging. So, I'm 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 hopeful and positive that we're going to kind of um, you know start seeing seeing people getting more confident in booking and 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 certainly more searches. There definitely seems to be the demand there it's just people are are just still quite rightly cautious around um around around booking at the moment but sorry i can't quite remember the the second part of the question what what did what was that 
No worries, sorry, I did fire a lot over. So the question from the audience was, there's a lot of news about how people may need to use less air travel to help people in the UK decarbonise. Do you anticipate changes to the sector as a result of younger consumers becoming more environmentally minded? I know you guys have quite a lot of insight at Top Cashback in terms of those consumers, and I wondered if you'd seen anything different across the generations. Yeah, and it is something that we previously, before before all this crazy um, lockdown, COVID happened, we were talking to, to our partners about the impact that that might have on, on us, and they were kind of um doing research from their sides about what what they can do uh, around that but it, it's hard to say i mean i think um this definitely has turned travel on its head and we we definitely are going to be in a very different place to where we were in 2019 and staycations are more popular i still think there's going to be a huge demand for traveling abroad um but yeah the younger generation they might may be more uh, you know focused on on being environmentally friendly and and that might mean that more uk bookings um but i think there will still be a huge variety of people who are desperate to you know to get the bit of winter sun <laughs> get to dubai but um yeah, yeah I, I, it's so hard to know really yeah and just on that staycation point, we've had a second question come through from the audience, which James, I don't know if you'd be keen to take this one soon as you're sort of launching that staycation product. Um, so it's with it looking likely that we are moving to a no deal. Do you anticipate more non EU destinations or will the staycate region supreme? Yeah, interesting one. So the, yeah, the news, as we've seen in the last couple of days, hot off the press, is that um, yeah, planes will be grounded on the yeah, come the first of January, which, which yeah, we obviously had to take quite seriously um, and look at how we potentially combat that internally. If that, if anything happens around that, the feeling within the business is is that it's going to be short lived. If it happens, and we think it's unlikely that it will happen, but if it does it'll only be for January. So we think planes will be grounded in January until people come back into work after the Christmas period. Those deals can be done and then planes will start then flying beyond then. Um, so we're not we're going to make some we're going to make some plans around around that um, potentially happening. But we don't see that. Yeah, we don't see that being a, a long term plan. Um, I think in terms of the yeah the staycation, I think yeah just going back to what I said previously, I think there will be some there will be customers um, and probably the the older generation that are more susceptible to to COVID will be more likely to stay in the UK um, as opposed to what they will deem taking a risk of you know, getting on a plane and going to another country. So. Um, we do see the, the the staycation being more more popular, um, but you know, as, as as everybody's been saying, particularly Harriet, you know, there's the demand is there. People are wanting to travel. People want to get back onto a plane as soon as there's a there's a green light, and there's um, and th there's definitely um, yeah, as Boris says, there's definitely the the cavalry are on the horizon, and the bugle is sounding. We we can see them coming. So. Yeah, the, we yeah you know, the, the the floodgates. We we expect the floodgates to start opening um, early next year to see people get back on the yeah you know, get back in the in the travel mindset. And I think you know just going back to um, I'd like to just comment on the um, on the the other question around uh, sustainability and the environment. Um, at Holiday Extras, we recognise that um, we yeah you know, we do have a footprint there in that. Um, our customers are travelling to predominantly travelling to the airport in in cars, and therefore that has a that has a footprint. Um, and and if you yeah if we, if we believe what we're hearing that petrol and diesel will be null and void come 2030, so electric vehicles will be the the way that people will travel, um, and that autonomous vehicles will also be a way that people travel so will there actually be a need for airport parking in the future that's a big question that we've got within the business so we're having to think about how we how we then um, diversify our business around that to to combat the fact that actually you might get a you know self-driven vehicle that takes you to the airport and then drives you back home comes back to collect you um you know even the airports have targets in place with the government to reduce their carbon footprint and their 
that they've got targets to reduce the amount of people that are driving to the airport. So public transport moving forward would be a, would be a much bigger, uh, much bigger tool um, for a couple for the customers to travel to the airport. So there is quite a lot of um, work going on around that um, in the background. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And, and Claire, I just wanted to get your thoughts while we're sort of all talking through the future of travel. So we've touched upon what we're expecting next year and James said he's already seen bookings coming in for 2022. Do you think consumers are really starting to book ahead or do you think there's still going to be some last minute bookings where there's still a level of nervousness or low consumer confidence? And I suppose as well as Brexit, there's things like the vaccine and any other factors that are playing into to those changes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny you mentioned um, Tui because uh, back in the Thomas Cook days, we always used to despair when they went on sale with their uh, future season so early and we were sort of scrabbling around to catch up. But um, yeah, I think people are are very much booking ahead. Certainly a lot of the promotions that we have live at the moment are for 2022. And, you know, people are, there is pent up demand, but there's also nervousness. You know, there's that sort of dichotomy of how people, you know, are desperate to have something in the diary, but there's still uncertainty about next year, um, whether that's Brexit, whether that's the vaccine, whether that's, you know, the uncertainty around everything. Um, really hard to tell. You know, we, we just don't don't know that sort of level of detail. But yes, yeah, certainly people are looking further out, especially for things that, you know, are important holidays. We know that lots of people have missed out on honeymoons. They've missed out on anniversaries. They've missed out on exciting birthdays so I think you know just banking them um, far enough ahead so that they know it's it's guaranteed has, has been a key part of that as well maybe, maybe that tip in um, average order value that you're seeing because actually it's it's the important big holidays that, that people are trying to get in the diary um, so yes future looking actually Sean mentioned something about you know being in the boat but there's a there was a really lovely phrase that kind of stuck in my mind and I come back to it often which is um, we've all been in the same storm, but we've all been in a very different boat and people have had very different experiences this year. Some good, some bad, um, some horrible. So I think the thing that we need to do kind of looking forward to next year is just be really sensitive to the changes in, in what we think we know about our customers. Um, the likelihood is that things have happened to them this year that will fundamentally change how we should be talking and marketing to them. So. I think that's the, the big thing to look out for next year, um, this sense that, you know, we have been very united, but we're actually quite divided at the same time. And, you know, with Brexit sort of coming back on the news agenda, that just adds another puddle of divisiveness back into, you know, how everybody's feeling at the moment. So I think, you know, just finding ways to think sensitively and in a very human way about how people feel about travelling for, for the coming year despite the, depend, the pent up demand is going to be really key. Yeah, you've given me a beautiful segue into my next question, so thank you. Um, so we've been talking about what we're expecting next year in terms of consumer behaviour, but I wanted to focus a little bit on, on our behaviour. So from a marketing perspective, what new strategies we want to employ. So Sean, I wanted to come to you next if possible and just really talk through, obviously we've seen digital scale this year massively we've, we've all been forced to move online from a consumer day-to-day -day perspective but also as professionals in the digital world we've had to adapt to new volumes coming through um, so I suppose how has that changed the way in which our strategies will be shaped for next year everything from our marketing techniques to our measurement yeah, I think um, I think Claire um, kind of summed that up beautifully there um, with with what she said, and I, I would just echo that. I think you know we, we talk all the time about being kind of customer first in 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 the way we kind of approach digital marketing, but I think going forward into 2021, it's it's going to have to be a lot more sensitive in a way, uh, and just kind of taking on board the, the, the kind of the rough time that everyone um, has had. So I think for us, I mean, you know, we've been we, we've done it to a certain extent throughout um, the last couple of months, but I think very much for our hotel clients, it is just about that reassurance angle with with um, customers. Is, you know 
OK, the nitty gritty of here's your cancellation kind of um, information and, uh, and reassuring them that way, but just kind of making sure that all communications with with um, kind of potential customers, it is just kind of holding their hand a little bit um, throughout the whole process and really kind of reassuring them that, yes, there are kind of, you know, better days to come um, and we would like to kind of help you get there. Um, but yeah, just kind of really um, focusing on that. So I think that's that's going to be key. I think for me, um, you know, as well, just looking at the way we, we kind of currently support our hotel clients, it, it is very much just focused around kind of trying to get people into to book rooms uh, and that is our kind of main KPI for the channel um, but I think for, for the hotel clients that we have I mean we're talking about all the different areas that they cover and um, whether that's kind of food and beverage um, sides whether that's uh, the gym corporate um, booking slash meeting side I think we'll, what we'll look to do is, is really kind of unify our messaging there I think you know the, the kind of the, the, the way a lot of hotel websites are, are set up currently um, you know you're going to get to a contact form you're going to get to a phone number which you know aren't the most affiliate friendly things in the world so i think a lot of what we're doing um will be trying to understand how we can kind of support our clients more but also with with the end goal of kind of making a customer's life easier so regardless of what area of of the hotel they want to engage with that you know they're being supported through um but also that it's it's, it's easy and it's straightforward for them um in a kind of an online capacity Perfect, thank you. And second to that, we've had an audience question come through that's probably really relevant to, I suppose, more specifically planning next year. And, and the, the main part of the question is around the type of partners that brands should be focusing on next year in terms of recruitment and activation in light of COVID. Yeah, I know um, you had um, Joelle at the start of the presentation there, just a kind of a breakdown of the, of the different kind of affiliate types and, and kind of how they fared throughout the year. Um, I think for us, you know, it hasn't changed. The mix hasn't changed massively. Um, you know, we, we like with any affiliate program we run at Equator, we always want to make sure that we've got kind of some standing with each of kind of the main affiliate group types. and We're not overly reliant on, on one. And I think that's obviously been an, an important strategy for a year like this. Um, but where we've had some kind of real progress, and this kind of kind of carries on really from um, some of the work the team did last year, was was kind of building out our relationship with a lot of the, the closed user group sites. And um, you know, they've been there for years and they've always done a brilliant job. But we'll say a website like um, the Blue Light Card guys, you know. They've really come into their own this year where you know they're, they're rewarding uh, the kind of the frontline workers and um, the healthcare workers and kind of giving those guys um, experiences and, and kind of offers as a way of, of kind of saying thanks and I think you know it, it has made absolute sense to work closer with those guys and um, from what from you know what we were doing kind of pre um, kind of pandemic um, I've seen a lot of, of the kind of the main players in the in, in the space as well adapt a kind of a similar model so anything that can be seen as kind of giving back to the people that are really at the the kind of the front line of this whether it's the teachers the social workers um, you know the nurses the doctors and I think you know I see that as being some something that we can further expand on still you know we're doing you know a lot of work there at the moment as I said you know the, the, the guys like Blue Light Card are doing a brilliant job but yeah I think we just kind of keep pushing that and um, because you know it, without kind of yeah jumping away too much from, from 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 the question I think it is important that we're obviously um, you know highlighting the, the good work that people are doing and, and the tough times they're going through and, and trying to reward them where we can. Yeah, definitely. It's it's been really nice to actually watch from a network perspective the different new partnerships that have been born out of supporting charities and the success we've yeah. seen them from a performance perspective. Um, before we move on, Hattie, I wondered from a publisher perspective if you had any advice in terms of how brands can help plan for next year and the best strategies for planning for Q1 and beyond. Yeah, so I think um, from our perspective, it is it is about kind of communication and, and being agile. And we're from we have a big pu uh, partnerships team, and we we do kind of are on hand to to adjust campaigns and and um, and plan as as it goes really, because because you know things are changing day to day, and and you do need to adapt and adjust to that. Um, so yeah, so for, from our perspective, I think it's it's going to be around communication and and collaboration and making sure that um, we we are planning in advance. So we're making sure that we we have the coverage and and the the right levels of targeting and and all those different types of things. Um, but at the same time, being able to to adapt when change happens and and making sure that we understand what impact change has on individual brands as well because it's not always necessarily um known to us on on the outside on the on what's happening to a business and what their focus is so it's is making sure that we understand if there's something that's changed in terms of government guidelines or whatever that, that will have an impact on on who they want to 
target and how they want to target them and and what message they want and and we just need to be making sure that we're kind of in the loop and and adapting with them and and you know working as a team really perfect and in a similar vein if i can stick with you on this one hattie i just wanted to talk about new and exciting partnerships that were um rising in, in the next year and if there's any that you're excited about launching or relaunching post covid yeah, so there isn't one in particular kind of um, partnership that we're, 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 that stands out. It's just, I suppose, it's going to be, travel is going to be a massive focus for us um, next year because we, yeah, we, we really want to um, use what amazing insight and data that we have at Top Cashback of our members and how they, they behave and, and use that to, to, to kind of get the, the sales that, um, that, the advertisers want um so so yeah i think um that's that's kind of the way we're going to go next year we, we want to work more closely we want to understand what um what kind of key objectives that each um individual grant has and really understand our member base and really understand what they're feeling and there's going to be people who are desperate to shop and desperate to to you know go on holiday and then there's those that are going to be more tentative and it's it's how we adapt that messaging for those individual types of of um, members and and target them in the right way and 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 do kind of bespoke exciting campaigns um on on that kind of level rather than just kind of one size fits all which is something obviously that we've been trying to move away from for a long time but um i think it's really important that we work closely together next year and and really kind of try and tackle um this you know all the issues that, that have arisen this year and and have a positive a, a positive uh, 2021 yeah definitely and in terms of new partnerships, James, I know me and you have been working on potentially interacting with some some brands through the network as opposed to as a brand interaction traditionally with affiliates. And I wondered if you could just talk the audience through that concept. Sure. So I think really traditionally holiday extras have um, always partnered with businesses that have um, a strong allegiance to travel. And I think this year we more than any year we've we've started to think about you know what other businesses are out there which we can align ourselves to which maybe don't have that such a big allegiance to travel but still have a still have a huge database that can offer they could offer our products to their customers um still um yeah still ha we also have the ability to potentially offer their products to our customers um where there's a where there's a a synergy with our products and their products um so it's you know we've started to explore some of those we haven't got any of those live yet um but um i'd expect to have those a few of those live early in um in the new year but yes it's, it's um it's been an exciting few months for us it's given us the opportunity to sort of circle back around and have a look at you know out, outside of our key partnerships where else can we focus certainly be excited when we see that first one go live um, I'm going to dive into some of the audience questions for a minute because we've got about 10 minutes left and there's about four or so in here um, Claire I wanted if I could come to you for the first one and um, so the question is do you think there's a missed opportunity in the affiliate channel for tourism boards and destination marketing organizations to use partners to drive better online awareness so the likes of visit Britain visit California and do you think this could change post COVID as destinations really compete for tourism? Oh, interesting one. Um, so I don't know whether you saw that back in the summer, Visit Britain were campaigning for the um, extra October bank holiday. Um, gutted that never got through, but um, <laughs> yeah, they were trying to make up for the, the mist or, or certainly kind of the, the bank holidays where we were. Um, lockdown because there was a huge recognition from from the travel and the tourism boards that you know we we they just aren't going to be driving people to to visit this year for obvious reasons. Um, I would love to see the tourism boards do more in this space. You know, as as Thomas Cook, we used to work very closely with all of the European and um, and broader uh, tourism boards. We had a very close relationship with Greece because it was a, a key destination, a growing destination for Thomas Cook at the time. Um, and a you know a place a, a group of islands that, that heavily rely on on attracting tourists um, across the summer 
but yeah, I think it would be extremely exciting to to see these these places also thinking about you know how they engage with with audiences directly and how they motivate people to want to come and visit destinations to explore to you know perhaps um, do things off the beaten track that that only they can really help customers um, discover and 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 book and plan for. Um, actually, back in my cherry days, we we we're pitching to visit Britain as well about you know creating a partnership program for them affinity partnerships and I don't think that ever got off the ground but the thinking is there the the impetus I think is there and maybe they just need a little nudge and maybe this year might be enough for them to to explore doing something like this yeah brilliant thank you um the next question, Sean, I wondered if you'd be able to help tackle for us from the audience. So we saw in some of the slides at the beginning that we've seen an, an increase in AOV throughout COVID, although a huge reduction in bookings. And an audience member has asked if we anticipate this trend to continue. So do we think individual travel spend per person will increase in 2021 because of that 2020 miss out? Yeah, I mean, I, I can only really comment from from a hotel perspective, um, but just just give a bit of context from from what really we experienced over the last couple of months. Um, you know, when businesses and hotels reopened, kind of late June, early July time, uh, we were off to the races. I've, I've kind of never seen anything like it. Really, there was just this massive spike of of bookings that came through, um, and you know, we were lucky enough that we had a lot of really um, decent relaunch offers to promote on the channel. So naturally the kind of the, the average kind of booking value was down because of that, purely because it was kind of short stays. And um, a lot of people who were just like, get me out of the house, I'm going to the, you know, the, the hotel down the road kind of thing. We, we saw an awful lot of that. And um, I think, I, I mean, I pulled a figure here just ahead of, of the chat today, but I know around the same time we were seeing this kind of activity happen, um, IHG came out with some figures themselves saying that within that period, um, they were seeing something like 40% of bookings in the UK were from a book to stay window were like 48 hours or less so just to give you an idea just how crazy that was and, and obviously a lot of that would have been driven by kind of offers as well just to get people back into the locations um, but what we've seen since and with a lot of our hotel clients kind of um, repositioning themselves um, really for for the kind of the, the news that we've seen and um, a lot of it has been based around kind of booking further ahead so longer kind of um, you know book, book to stay dates we're seeing an awful lot of that we're also seeing as well um, a much increased um, average booking value purely down to the fact that people are if they're going to go away now they're making a, a more of a stay of it they're going for two or three nights and um, you know they're taking the add-ons that you know maybe they wouldn't have before and I see a lot of that increase and also you know you, you got to um, consider as well especially for the kind of the Monday to Friday stuff a lot of the kind of transient business traveler type people who would stay for one night and on, on the go again on the motorway you're not going to really see a lot of that I would imagine or you're definitely not going to see the levels kind of pre-pandemic and um, so yeah it, it, it's been as I said it's been a bit of a roller coaster from you know absolute off to the races volume wise um, kind of coming back down again but now we're seeing kind of um, you know as I said more more kind of um, longer stays and stuff like that so I I would imagine that will happen, but I'm sure you guys might feel the same as as well. But just looking at kind of forecasting for next year and where we're going to be, like what's March 2021 going to look like in comparison to March 2020? What's July 2021 going to look like? It's going to be so hard to kind of pinpoint where the trends are going to be. From for purely from our hotel client perspective, I think it will be kind of seasonal offers will definitely help drive that. But you know we're all at the mercy of of kind of when when we can kind of um, you know get out and about again. So yeah, we'll, it, it, there'll definitely be an element of kind of wait and see. Yeah, and, and as you were answering that, somebody actually directed a question to, to you just in regards to the hotel trends specifically. If you're right, just pick this one up. So yep. are you seeing any differences between the luxury and popular hotels? And do you think that's because of consumer confidence and behaviour? Yeah, it's a weird one. And again, not to go off on a mad tangent, but one of the hotel programs we launched actually in the middle of the pandemic was, was for the Belfry, which is kind of quite a world renowned um, golf resort and definitely a more premium resort. Um, and even though they were technically closed in um, November, it was actually the record month for bookings that we saw for them because they, they're, they're kind of taken on board. Um, you know, th there is a desire there to get out of the city, to spend a couple of nights away and, and more, you know, further down the line whether that is kind of January February time or even further still so we're definitely seeing a demand there and that, that a lot of that has to do with how our hotel clients are kind of not repositioning themselves but almost kind of taken on board that you know this is what's more appealing to, to people at the moment um, and then with, with with the kind of the more um 
kind of business as usual stuff. I think a lot of our hotel chains, like I said, they've just had to readapt to missing that kind of midweek business traveler type, you know, that, that aren't there anymore. You know, I think we, we, we narrowed it down to about four or five different types of professions that were still making up um, kind of business travelers throughout the pandemic, like, you know, people working for open reach or, and stuff like that, but it was so diminished. Um, and I think a lot of our hotel clients have been trying to make up that gap with, as I said, kind of whether it's better offers or kind of one night, two night stays, whatever it is. Um, I think that's where they've been trying to kind of fill the void as well. Brilliant. Thank you for that. We have three minutes left, so I would like to end with a final question and ideally I'd love you all to answer it. So we'll do a bit of a quick fire round in the next couple of minutes. But really just if you if each of you could offer some industry advice to your peers listening in terms of practicalities for the new year and, and successful tactics for the new year, what would that be? Um, Sean, should we start with you as we were we were just talking to you? Yeah, no worries. I mean, I, I touched there at the very, very start when we chatted about just kind of making sure the lines of communication were open. You were speaking to your affiliate partners, you were speaking to your clients or, or internally with your teams. I guess the flip side of that is, is listen as well. I mean, understand the pain points, understand how, how your affiliate partners, how your clients are adapting and just make sure that you're trying to help out and support as much as you can. And I know that sounds like super fluffy and top level, but really it has been what's gotten us through um, the last couple of months. And I think it's going to be so important going forward as well. Perfect. Thank you. Hattie? Yeah, so my similar similar uh, theme there in terms of communication um, and and collaboration, but um, but also I suppose with 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 a challenge comes uh, comes creativity and and you know working together and and uh, digging deep and and finding new solutions um, and, and and you know overcoming the challenges. So hopefully it will result in in more creativity. Thank you, Claire. Um, I, it's to build really on a, a point before, but just listen deeply to customers. Um, you know, they will be the people that tell us what they want and when they want it. Um, you know, having the things in place that allow you to respond quickly and, and be agile, like Hattie mentioned, using your data sensibly um, are, are, are good ways to, to have your ears open. But I think the, the, the key thing is just having that dial of sensitivity up for next year because you know yes we're talking about average order values you know predicting that they're going to be quite large I think there will also be a, a large amount of people who will struggle to scrape together pennies to do anything you know grand next year so um, big dial of humanity for next year. Thank you and last but not least James. <laughs> Um, I guess mine's quite simple really and takes me back to my Cub Scout days. It's it's really be prepared, I think. Um yeah, we're you know, we're going back it we're going into twenty twenty one. Um holidays are coming. They are as Coca Cola said, they're definitely coming and the vaccines are coming. So the resurgence of travel is is will happen. And I think the most important thing you can do right now is just prepare yourself for that to happen not sit back and wait for it to happen do everything you can in the background to make sure you're there to soak up as much of that revenue as you can when that resurgence comes back and just don't miss it and be slow off the mark brilliant thank you so much um we timed that perfectly guys you landed exactly on four o'clock so thank you all that's left for me to say is thank you so much to the audience for dialing in and for your time today. Thank you so much for our panel. I've really, really enjoyed our discussions. And if anyone has any further questions, do feel free to reach out to, to myself, joelle.hillman at awin.com. Thanks everyone. Have a good one.